The idea that might does not make right is relatively new in the annals of human history, and the aspiration that universal human rights overrule such violence and protect the rights of weak and strong alike is an ongoing struggle. Lawyer Payam Akhavan has spent much of his professional life fighting for that objective on behalf of untold victims of brutal crimes over the past quarter century. He is this year's CBC Massey lecturer, and that series of talks has been collected under the title In Search of a Better World, A Human Rights Odyssey. And that odyssey brings him to our studio tonight. It's great to have you back here again. Thank you. You reminded me uh, that uh, you were actually here many years ago on a rights and democracy discussion. So it's good to see you back in that chair. Thank you very much. Good to be here. You have spent so much of your professional life observing some of the worst human history has to offer. Uh, genocides in places like Bosnia and Rwanda. And the book title, In Search of a Better World, provokes me to ask you, how's the search going? <laughs> it's in process. It's in process. And one of the um, uh, humbling things that we learn in the arena of struggle is that um, uh, there is uh, no room for instant gratification in the struggle for justice. Uh, we have to accept that it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of patience, a lot of determination in order to achieve change. And I think that uh, the failure to understand that is part of the reason why people become so easily disappointed and disillusioned. You know, I think cynicism is effortless. It's very easy to become cynical. And it's also very easy to have ideals when you are naive and you haven't really been wounded for your beliefs. So um, part of what I'm trying to convey in this book is a simple proposition that if you stand for truth, there will always be a price to pay. And you have to accept that you're going to go out there and get wounded, uh, but also that um, without that struggle, life really doesn't have much of a purpose or, or, or meanings. I wonder what you think of the fact, well, we've had in the last uh, few weeks, uh, both Barack Obama and Bill Clinton visit the city of Toronto and give speeches that essentially said, if you care about human rights, if you care about justice, if you care about violence, if you care about war, this is actually the best time in human history to be alive. Now, empirically, that may be true, but from where you sit and stand on this issue, does it feel that way? It is true that much of our history is about rape, pillage, and murder. Uh, throughout most of human history, uh, it's been accepted that the victor can exterminate and enslave the vanquished. And the idea of human rights is very recent. We can speak about the youth of human rights. It's only 1948 that the UN adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and only after the Holocaust, after all the unspeakable atrocities of the 20th century. So we have to have that historical perspective and realize that it's astonishing that today we don't accept that people should be slaughtered with impunity. We demand justice. We demand a better world. That's a positive development. Well, yes, except that if you are someone from Aleppo or from Srebrenica or from Rwanda mm -hmm. who has experienced those extreme injustices, you have a different uh, sense of urgency about why human rights matter. Uh, and I do think that uh, we have a, a heightened sensitivity, which is a sign of progress. But getting back to the uh, narrative of the Bill Clintons and the Barack Obamas, and sort of the liberal narrative that um, we are going to achieve human rights if we just continue with the current neoliberal order, I think that is a fundamentally flawed assumption. Uh, we need to uh, rethink how we can reconcile the uh, consumerist culture uh, of uh, you know, greed and, and, and self-absorption mm -hmm. with the idea that human dignity should be the foundation of civilization. And the two, I think, are incompatible. Here's you in search of a better world. I'm going to quote, the early glimmering of this new conception of international legitimacy stands in sharp contrast to the casual acceptance of atrocities throughout much of history. For too long, the extermination and enslavement of vanquished nations was deemed the natural right of the victor. The transformation of ritual barbarity into an international crime cannot be taken for granted. I want to put two names out there and have you tell us what they accomplished uh, as we consider the past 150 years of improvements in civil rights. Henry Dumont in Europe, Franz Lieber in the US. What did they accomplish? Well, uh, I talk about Franz Lieber and um, he was a Prussian army officer who fought and was wounded in the Battle of Waterloo. 
And then he emigrated to the Carolinas. Uh, and during the American Civil War, he, he joined the forces of the North with his two sons, whereas one of his sons fought on the side of the South. And um, he, um, in a series of lectures at Columbia University, um, prepared a, a series of lectures on how war could be humanized. And uh, the so-called Lieber Code, which was eventually adopted by President Lincoln, became the beginning of modern humanitarian law, what we call the laws of war. Basically, uh, trying to minimize the inherent uh, inhumanity of, of war by trying to spare civilians, trying to spare even combatants from unnecessary suffering. Um, and today, we have the Geneva Conventions of 1949 that we all know about. We have the International Red Cross Movement. Uh, Henri Dunant, uh, who I also mention, is a remarkable man. He was a Swiss businessman who had businesses in uh, Algeria, which was then a French colony. And he was uh, coming to Lombardy in Italy to meet with Napoleon III because of his business interests. And Napoleon III was finishing a battle in a town called Solferino. Uh, and Henri Dunant accidentally saw the scenes of carnage, thousands of soldiers writhing in agony, dying slow, painful deaths. He was so horrified that he assembled a group of women from the local village and made a makeshift hospital to treat the wounded soldiers. That became the beginning of the Red Cross movement. Hmm. So once, uh, we, we, time and again, I've seen how people who do extraordinary feats in humanitarian law or you know, other types of uh, you know, progressive uh, endeavors have always been touched by suffering one way or the other. Franz Lieber was touched by what he saw in the slave uh, farms of, of the South, as well as the Battle of Waterloo. And Henri Dunant was horrified at, at seeing all these young men dying uh, painful deaths. So th there's a very simple lesson to be learned there, I think. I don't necessarily want to draw a straight line between their work and yours, but the fact is you yourself, in your background, have experienced some pain, which has brought you to where you are today. Uh, could you touch on the fact that your family fled Iran, uh, came to Canada in the early 1980s, and tell us why? Yes, we actually came uh, uh, in the 70s. We're, we, we are kind of like preemptive refugees. <laughs> we left before we had to leave. You saw it coming. And we always knew that being a member of the um, Iranian Baha'i religious minority, which was the traditional scapegoat in Iran, that if there was any political turmoil, we would be the first victims. And that was a very accurate prediction. So in 1978-79, when the Islamic Revolution happened, um, a, a, a systematic policy of uh, what was in effect extermination of the Baha'i leadership began and many of our loved ones were executed, many were sent to prison, many had to escape across mountains. So we came to Canada in style compared to how some of our uh, family and, and, and friends had to escape. Um, so, you know, being in Canada as a child, trying to fit in, uh, especially during, you know, adolescence, trying to be popular uh, in your high school, I was confronted with the reality of my 16-year-old contemporary, Mona Mahmoud Najad, who was put in prison, brutally tortured, and hanged for writing an essay, an essay where she called for freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, just completely shattered my complacency. It shook me to the core. And it made me ask what good my freedom in Canada was if I would turn my back to her horrible suffering. Uh, so that was for me a turning point where I, I could have either, either turned my back to what I'd witnessed or I could dedicate my life to struggling for justice. And you clearly have chosen to do the latter. What, what is it, let me ask a follow-up about your faith. Why is the Baha'i faith um, so significantly in the crosshairs of the regime in Iran? Well, the Baha'i faith began in the 19th century and it was a very uh, modern you can call it kind of spiritual movement. It believed in the equality of men and women. It believed in the democratization of spiritual knowledge, the idea that, th that there was no role for clerical intermediaries in the individual search for truth. It believed in the establishment of a world commonwealth uniting all nations. Uh, it believed that all religions come from the same source. So it was a, a very popular among people living in the backwardness and, and, and corruption of 19th century uh, Iran. Uh, and of course, it threatened the business model of the Islamic clerics. And 
they began to demonize and scapegoat the Baha'is and instigate uh, pogroms uh, against them. Uh, so, you know, we were brought up in Iran knowing the stories of the genocides against our ancestors in, in the 19th century. And to this day, the Islamic Republic of Iran is uh, persecuting the Baha'is uh, uh, and referring to them as a wayward sect. Uh, and they are systematically uh, discriminated against and, and have been victims of, of uh, horrific violence. I think you said in your Massey lecture in Toronto that, that while you don't want to come off like an angry guy, um, you don't also want to let go of the anger that helps propel the work that you do. And I guess I've got to ask whether or not uh, that anger ever trends towards a desire for revenge against those who mm. have harmed you, your family, your friends, etc. It's a very good question. And I think uh, um, emotions are very complex, but they are absolutely essential to the struggle for justice. So I do fundamentally believe that until we feel the pain of injustice, we will never understand why human dignity is important. We will never understand why we have a personal responsibility to stand up, speak truth to power, and if necessary, pay the price. Um, but I think that um, uh, anger and grief can also consume you and, and um, render you incapable of giving your best you know, in the struggle to build a better world. I get you don't want that to happen. But... Well, and it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle uh, uh, as you grapple with your own pain, your own grief, your own sense of loss. Uh, and then you realize over time that, um, uh, that one can actually reconcile forgiveness and justice. That um, I tell the story of Jean-Paul Samputu, whose family was killed by his best friend during the genocide in Rwanda. And after many years of you know, alcohol and drugs and self-destruction, he finds his friends and he forgives them. He forgives them. People think he's crazy. He says, no, I forgave him for my own sake, for my own mm -hmm. survival. But that doesn't mean that while forgiving, we can still not struggle for justice because justice is not about revenge. Justice is in a kind of Kantian way about restoring the moral equilibrium of the universe. Have you forgiven the regime for its crimes? I think that... The fact that they are still in power, the fact that they are still committing these crimes makes it that much more difficult. Um, but uh, I also have realized that people who oppress and torment others are fundamentally weak. Um, you know, the, 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 the torturer is uh, also denying his own humanity. So I think it's important to understand that, that um, we need to redefine the idea that we have of power. So I'd like to think that I am more powerful than the person that needs to torture someone to feel powerful. And that dynamic allows you to engage in social struggle in a very different way. Uh, I think we have too much uh, anger in our discourse of social justice, and that ends up replicating the same injustice that you're trying to fight. Here's another excerpt from the book. <clears throat> Throughout the 20th century, international justice had followed a predictable pattern. At opportune moments, unconscionable atrocities would lead to ever more lofty principles and institutions. This dialectic of disaster begetting progress would emerge once again in the post-Cold War era with the Yugoslav Wars. Some 50 years after the Nuremberg Judgment, it would finally set the scene for the establishment of a permanent international criminal court, with which, of course, you have had uh, dealings and a relationship. Bit, bit of an in-your-face question here. How many people had to die in the former Yugoslavia for this finally to happen? Well, in Bosnia, there were about 100,000 victims. And then uh, there was Croatia, there was uh, Kosovo, um, and the, the, the sad reality is that um, we don't have enough political leaders uh, with vision. And we even ridicule the idea of being, you know, political visionary. Uh, but I think that in an interdependent world, uh, being a visionary is being also a realist because we need global institutions uh, in a world that is inextricably interdependent. So let me uh, ask you about the effectiveness of this new international, relatively new international institution. Nuremberg, post-World War II, Nazis on trial, lasted for less than a year, mm -hmm. dealt with 24 accused, and 
did its job with the most evil regime in the history of the world. The International Criminal Court in The Hague tried to get Slobodan Milosevic, uh, the butcher of Belgrade, I guess they called him, the Serbian leader responsible for much of the mayhem in Bosnia. Um, it went on, it went on, it went on. It took four years, and eventually he died in prison of a heart attack, and he was never, quote-unquote, brought to justice. What do we infer about the effectiveness of the ICC? Well, the Yugoslav Tribunal uh, is different than the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and it was, it was a, an ad hoc court established by the UN only for Yugoslavia. And I think it was remarkably successful, because when I joined the court, in my 20s, uh, we didn't think we would arrest a single person. We thought we would be a kind of paper tiger issuing symbolic indictments. The fact that Milosevic died as a prisoner and not as a head of state itself is phenomenal. It is, uh, uh, you know, astonishing. We, we, were, we thought we were dreaming when he ended up in The Hague as a defendant. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, criticism that can be leveled against the court. It took uh, very long to, to prosecute the cases, which were very complex. Uh, but the fact that uh, these leaders were put on trial, I think, has made a fundamental difference on where former Yugoslavia is today and where it would have been. Let but the International fall. Criminal yeah. Court um, is less effective because it has a universal mandate and it has jurisdiction in regard to countries that have accepted its jurisdiction. And typically, countries that commit crimes against humanity don't uh, sign the statute of the same court that's going to turn around and prosecute their leadership. So Syria is not a state party, Iran is not a state party, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And neither are the leading powers of the day, the United States, the Russian Federation, China, uh, other countries such as India. So uh, building a, an effective system of global justice is part of an evolutionary process. And 20, 25 years ago, we had a culture of complete impunity throughout the UN era. Not one person was put on justice for genocide. So now we've established a beachhead. <laughs> and um, it, the, the system is still uh, fledgling. It's still weak, but it is there. And now we need to build it and make it stronger and more effective. If you were the decider, would you have George W. Bush and Tony Blair face trial in the ICC for the Iraq war? I think that we need to look at the definition of the crime of aggression. And the crime of aggression is unlawful use of force, um, contrary to the uh, UN Charter. And by that definition, a case could be made that, yes, the invasion of Iraq was unlawful. And one of the um, basic um, crimes which were prosecuted at Nuremberg was called crimes against peace, the waging of a war of, of aggression. Uh, but I would add to that the uh, Russian invasion of Georgia, uh, the Russian invasion of the Crimea. Those are equally crimes of aggression. Um, but the reality, of course, is that those are exactly the countries that have not accepted the jurisdiction of the court. Mm. And justifiably, countries from the global south believe that there is a double standard, and, and that undermines the value of global justice. Now, we, we started at uh, the beginning of our conversation with you mentioning that we're almost 70 years removed from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the United Nations, which was designed to put human rights, you know, as a higher priority in the world and hopefully prevent future genocides. We know, of course, that has not happened. How disappointed are you in the United Nations that it has, it has not lived up to those lofty aspirations? There is plenty of room to be disappointed, but there is also plenty of space for optimism. And there has been progress. But as I said, the progress is painful and it's slow. So it's easy to despair and be disappointed and to point fingers. It's much more difficult to roll up your sleeves and get involved and make things happen. I think we have, um, interestingly enough, we live in an era where, getting back to wars of aggression, wars of aggression throughout history, where a natural part of how states dealt with each other. Clausewitz famously said that war is the continuation of foreign policy by other by means. Other means yep. So today, you and I have this conversation about wars of aggression because it's become such an anomaly, such a rare exception. Mm. Um, but there is still a lot of violence in our world. Uh, and I think we need to, um, once again, realize that building those institutions that will address these issues um, are, you know, part of a struggle. So getting back to the Yugoslav tribunal, it would have been unthinkable in the Cold War 
to put someone like Slobodan Milosevic on, on trial. But now we have a precedent, a former head of state who's arrested, extradited to The Hague and, and, and put on trial, Charles Taylor, the former president of, of Liberia. And one could go on and on to speak about what would have happened if the genocidaire in Rwanda were never put on trial. Mm. Um, so uh, we don't have a panacea that's going to solve all problems uh, overnight. It's going to take time. And that's why I speak about our responsibility. We need to speak truth to power. We need to tell our political leaders that we demand justice, that we demand a stronger international criminal court, stronger bodies at the UN to protect human rights. Mm -hmm. And we need to build a constituency for human rights if we want to see those changes happen. To that end, let me ask you one of these on the one hand, on the other hand questions. You invoke the hope for a world of universal empathy where we recognize each other as equals. But on the other hand, you are a bit, um, you are a bit chippy when it comes to uh, the scorn you express for the so-called do-gooders, um, you know, the slacktivists who will click on some page on Facebook and that's the extent to which they want to get involved. Just tell me a little bit more about why you are so scornful of that aspect of activism, slacktivism, whatever you want to call it. Well, I've seen how very often human rights, uh, because they are so sacred in our secular world, so they're, they're so fundamental to our self-conception, that we uh, indulge in a lot of hypocrisy. And I think we need to be authentic about the struggle for justice, because otherwise we create the illusion of progress, which sometimes is worse than not doing anything at all. So when uh, politicians and Hollywood celebrities and billionaire bosses pay lip service to human rights, uh, but actually don't do anything to help the victims, then where does that leave us? And I talked about the global summit on victims of sexual violence and armed conflict, which had Angelina Jolie and the celebrities talking about the victims of rape in Congo, uh, which is a very worthy cause, but the conference costs five million pounds, whatever, eight million dollars, and almost nothing is given to the non-government organizations that are on the ground trying to help the victims. So what is that all about? Is that it's about... not a sexy enough issue? Is that the idea? Well, I think... Or it's too well, uncomfortable? No, no, well, the issue is sexy, <clears throat> unfortunately, and it's a terrible way to put it, that, you know, it's a fashionable issue. Victims of rape in the Congo. And you get a lot of political capital. It's like a branding exercise. Look at me, I feel sorry for the victims of rape in the Congo. <laughs> but then the people that are there helping these poor girls that have been brutally raped and traumatized, have no resources. So do we really care about helping the victims or are we just interested in a branding exercise to use other people's suffering as a platform for the demonstration of our own virtue? Hmm. So I think we need to have a brutally honest conversation about our own hypocrisy, which explains why these injustices persist and, and the subterfuge of, oh, everything is fine, the status quo is fine, we're doing good in the world. So I'm not against do-gooders. I don't want to be cynical, not at all. I think cynicism is, is a, a kind of defeatism, which I will not accept. We need to be uh, authentic, full of hope, full of passion, and fully engaged. But we need to be authentic and honest. And if we really want to help the victims, then we should not be thinking about what's in it for me, <laughs> but really thinking what do they need. We need to listen to their voices and give them a, a, a genuine uh, help and assistance. Payam, we're down to our last minute here, which is not much time to tackle this last issue, but it is what it is, so let's try this. Is the United Nations, in your view, still the best vehicle to pursue the mission that you've spent your life pursuing? My answer is a definite yes and no. <laughs> the United Nations is absolutely indispensable. It needs to be uh, strengthened, given the tools that are necessary to deal with the global problems in a global age. But I believe much more in uh, 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 social movements, in grassroots activism, and the empowerment of the masses. Because As opposed of, to government. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think we um, would be foolish to think that political elites, uh, even if they were well-intentioned, could really bring about lasting change. I think the conversations that we have uh, amongst ourselves and the choices that we make ultimately are what allows for lasting uh, social, moral, spiritual transformation. And, um, you know, where there's apathy, there's always an excuse. Where there's empathy, there's always a solution. That's what I like to say. Well put. Uh, thank you so much for coming into TVO tonight and sparing some time for us. Uh, the book is terrific, In Search of a Better World, A Human Rights Odyssey. It's taken you all over the country, right, for your massy lectures. And uh, I was happy to be able to go to the one in Toronto recently. So.
Thank you so much again. Payam Akhavan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.